me have you turn in your Bibles this morning to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Pastor John has read the passage we're going to be looking at already this morning. So I'll just have you turn there to 1 Samuel 15 and we will pray together and do our best to see the Lord's glory in the preaching of the word in 1 Samuel 15. Let's pray. Our Father God, now as we come to your word to hear it preached, we pray, Lord, that you would send your spirit to attend the preaching and the hearing and the doing of the word, particularly as we look at difficult truths this morning. We pray, Father, that you would be in our midst, helping us to understand, to submit, and to believe, and to respond. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, recently in 1 Samuel, as we've come up through the end of chapter 14, we've seen the historical account of the warfare between Israel and the Philistines, including Jonathan's attack on the Philistine garrison in Geba, uh, the Philistines responding by gathering a large army, Saul's sinful impatience in not waiting for Samuel to come and seek the Lord with him, and then Jonathan's covert operation attacking another Philistine garrison with his armor bearer, eventually leading to a great victory in Israel. And then most recently, we saw Saul's rash oath binding his army not to eat until evening on a battle day. Foolish. And this ended with Jonathan's life being saved from his father by the people. But they were not able to win a more thorough victory over the Philistines because of all of that nonsense. Well, that section then ended in chapter 14 with a description of the ongoing battles against surrounding nations. Basically, I think what we have at the end of chapter 14 is kind of a historical assessment or an overview of Saul's accomplishments. And there were many good things from the outward perspective that he did. But then it seems like the historical record of 1 Samuel, then in chapter 15, transitions the end of 14 is that assessment of Saul's battles and also a description of his family and those who served him closely. And then chapter 15 begins a transition over to David, really, as we start to see the beginning of the end of Saul's reign. Now at the end of chapter 14 in verse 48, it says that Saul gathered an army and attacked the Amalekites and delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. And it seems like that statement is actually elaborated on in 1 Samuel 15. And so the account that we're beginning today is the account that is summarized there in the end of 14. Now, I've been trying to keep up the pace in this study, often preaching a chapter a week, maybe two weeks. But as I took a look at this chapter and got into it, I decided that we needed to slow down at least for today to try to take some time to answer one of the more difficult questions in the Bible. Now, we are generally committed at Arbor Church to expository preaching through various books of the Bible because we want to understand the, the whole counsel of God. We want to understand and submit to all that He revealed to us in His Word. Now, I'll be frank with you that if I were not committed to such things, I probably wouldn't preach this message that I'm preaching this morning. But I think it's a good thing that we are looking at this. Because the question that we're looking at, and questions like this one, are questions that would tempt some to reject Christianity or even walk away from the faith. And the basic question that, we're, that I want to look at this morning 
is why did God command Saul to utterly destroy the Amalekites? The language is pretty intense. If you look at the first part of chapter 15 again, it says, Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. You know, just reading that passage makes you almost want to weep. What is going on here? Why did God command Israel to utterly destroy Amalek? Well, in order to try to answer that question, we're going to do a couple things. We're going to start out by looking briefly at the history of the Amalekites, revealed to us especially in Scripture. And then we're going to take a look at some biblical principles by which we should be uh, looking at a passage like this. Now, I'm not going to claim to answer all of your questions before this is done this morning. But hopefully we can perhaps have a perspective from Scripture as to what is going on here. So when we consider the history of the Amalekites and why commanded such a thing, you begin to get a couple of glimpses just even right here in this text. Samuel comes right out and says, as a part of his faithfulness in conveying the word of the Lord to Saul, that God was going to punish Amalek for what Amalek did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. It's interesting how at times God will address a people group or a nation as if they were a person. Oftentimes we see not only this word coming against Amalek, but when the prophets prophesied, often they're prophesying against Assyria or Babylon or a, you know, a nation, Edom, a, a, a person perhaps, but a nation really, and almost encapsulated in referring to them as a person sometimes, or perhaps the one who started that nation. Well, it's helpful for us to understand when we think about the context here that essentially the Amalekites were terrorists. They were thieves and robbers. They were opportunists. They made their living by attacking those who were weak, stealing their wealth, and possibly even stealing their people. And while Israel had battles with numerous nations along the way, it seems that the Amalekites were the first to attack Israel on their way into the promised land when they were coming up out of Egypt. Now, I think it would be a good idea today for us to take a look at a couple of passages. A lot of times I'll just read it, um, but I want you to get in the habit of bringing your own Bible to church. Kids, one of the reasons I want you to bring your Bibles to church is so that when we When we look at something, you can see it for your own eyes in your own copy of God's Word and realize that this is what God is saying, not just what Pastor Steve is is coming up with. So if you're willing, I'm going to have you turn to a couple passages today. I'm going to start with Exodus chapter 17, and I want us to look at some of this history of the Amalekites. Now, I don't have all of the the page numbers if you're using a pew Bible, but Exodus is the second book of the Bible, and so should be relatively easy to find, Genesis, Exodus. Exodus chapter 17 gives us some of this account. As Israel is wandering in the wilderness between Egypt and the promised land, we have this account in Exodus 17 starting in verse 8. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, 
Choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, and take note of this, this is, this is crucial for what we're looking at here in 1 Samuel 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is My Banner. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn... The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, I would imagine that many have read that account, even in Bible story books and in the Bible itself. We remember that, don't we, because of Moses' hands being upheld during the battle and having to have help doing that so that they would win. Now, Israel was able to turn back Amalek at this point, but not utterly destroy them, but rather defeat them and turn them back for the moment. But the Amalekites continually attacked Israel through the years and oppressed them, and and you can follow some of that in their history through the book of Numbers and especially the book of Judges as you see the Amalekites coming at Israel coming to take what they can from them, to kill their people, to oppress them, to steal their stuff. For no good reason other than that, the Amalekites wanted what the Israelites had and were going to hurt them until they could get it. Even if you remember the account of Balaam, who I don't know that I would consider him to be a a faithful prophet, but he did end up prophesying some things from God. If you remember in Balaam's fourth prophecy, I'll just read this one in Numbers 24 and verse 20, um, and amongst a number of other prophecies that Balaam was giving, he said, uh, it says, then he looked on Amalek and he took up his oracle and said, Amalek was first among the nations but shall be last until he perishes. So what we've seen so far is that the Amalekites attacked Israel for no good reason when the Israelites were vulnerable and trying to make their way to the promised land. They continued to attack Israel from the days of Joshua through the judges. And and in a sense, you could think of it like this, that Israel could never really be at peace with them around. Now, you could say that about other nations as well, but it was true of the Amalekites. It's also true that the idolatrous culture of the Amalekites was a threat to Israel's worship of Jehovah. And even though some time had passed since Amalek had attacked Israel, here in 1 Samuel 15, it's clear that they still had the same murderous spirit in Saul's day that they had in Moses' day. But now I want you to turn to one other passage. It's in Deuteronomy. So if you could find Exodus, it's just three books past that, the end of the books of the law. Deuteronomy chapter 25. Remember, this is the, the second giving of the law. God is conveying his will to Moses and to the people. And I want you to see what is in here. It gives us a little bit more of a glimpse. We don't have all of the details in Exodus 17. We actually have a little bit more detail in Deuteronomy 25 that helps us to understand 
how bad it was and why God decided to do what he did. Deuteronomy chapter 25, look at verse 17. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear, when you were tired and weary, and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around, in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Well, that time was now. So at the end of 1 Samuel 14, where you see Saul waging war with the enemies surrounding Israel, it really is somewhat of a prophetic fulfillment of the law here at the end of Deuteronomy 25, where God says that when you have rest from your enemies all around, you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So this was a decision that God actually made back when Amalek attacked Israel coming up out of Egypt. It was reiterated in the law to Israel And now the time had come for this command and prophecy to be fulfilled. So when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 15 then, the text that we're looking at this morning, this is really the ongoing saga of the Amalekites and their hatred for Israel. But there are still questions Why would God command such a thing and why would he command this utter destruction that would include men, women, and children as well as livestock? So in order to try to answer some of those questions, I want us to look at some big picture principles that help us understand God's perspective on this issue. Now because of the nature of this this morning, I actually have some longer quotes than I might normally use, and hopefully some things that will be helpful for us to think through this. First of all, it's helpful for us to understand in God's command to destroy Amalek that this is an act of divine justice, not personal vengeance. Now, before we continue, one of the things I want us to keep in our mind, because these are heavy things, and we're talking about sin, and we're talking about judgment, and these are heavy things. And so one of the things I want us to keep in our mind is the Lord Jesus Christ came because, largely, of God's preservation of Israel, and the Lord Jesus is our refuge from judgment. You can't really talk about salvation without talking about sin. You can't talk about being safe in Christ in the refuge of His arms and sheltered under His wings without talking about what the danger is. And so a lot about what we're talking about here this morning is the danger of God's judgment. And that can start feeling pretty heavy. So what I want to encourage you with when you begin to feel the heaviness of God's judgment is that if you're sitting here this morning, we have opportunity, if we haven't already, we have opportunity to flee to Christ. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, there will not be the Father's judgment on us because of our sin. That is the beauty of the doctrine which we talk about a lot, we sing about a lot, we sang about it this morning, His robe is for mine. We sing and we preach and we talk and we read about justification, which in a sense you could say is our salvation. Jesus in the sinner's place. Yes, we sing the word propitiation here at Arbor Church in our music. It means that Jesus turned the just wrath of God away from us because his sacrifice was completely sufficient 
But his sacrifice was Jesus paying the penalty for my sins. But instead of me being judged for my sins, Jesus was judged for my sins. So I can't tell you that preaching about judgment is not heavy. It is. But what I can say is even while we are trying to faithfully understand judgment, we can recognize that we can find a refuge under the wings of the Lord Jesus Christ because what He has done on behalf of sinners. There is a real danger. And even as we talk about the Amalekites this morning, they really represent mankind, unregenerate mankind, living in rebellion against God anticipating the judgment that is to come. And so if you, if you find yourself outside of Christ feeling like an Amalekite facing judgment, the beauty of our situation here this morning is that it doesn't have to stay that way. We can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we will not need to face the judgment that is set for all who continue in their sin under the wrath of God. So the first principle is that this command to utterly destroy the Amalekites is an act of divine justice, not personal vengeance. God's law actually forbade people from doing things out of personal vengeance, but it's helpful to remember where this authority came from. Why was it okay for Israel to do this thing at this particular point in history? Well, it's because the authority for such national judgment came from God. God used Israel to bring about this judgment on Amalek, but it was God's decision to judge Amalek, not Israel's. And that's important for us to remember. Even the language of our text in 1 Samuel. Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, which meant that Saul answered to God as the king of a covenant people. Samuel says, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel. How he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. It was God's authority. Saul's authority as king came directly from God who chose him and had Samuel anoint him as king. Now Saul was to listen carefully to the voice of the words of the Lord in this command. And God says, I will attack Amalek. Now go and attack Amalek. Just like we've been studying in the adult Sunday school class in the confession. I know Pastor John has been working through some of this with other teachers as well, that Israel might be the, the tool, if you will. Israel might be the instrument in God's hands. But Israel is what we would call the second cause. God is the first cause bringing this to pass, and Israel is being used by God to accomplish His purposes. Even as we think about difficult things, we have to remember the sovereignty of God that for instance, you think about how God speaks through Amos the prophet in Amos 3.6. If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? You see, even in a fallen world and even with sinful men, ultimately God brings to pass everything according to His own counsel. And so even using the sins of men is a part of His decree. Even using the, the horrible aspects of a fallen world like tornadoes where people die is something that God actually is in control of. And so it's helpful for us to remember in this situation that this was an act of divine justice with the authority of God behind it, not just personal vengeance. Second principle, and these will overlap some, but think they're worth looking at individually as well. Second principle, we must evaluate this account based on what we know of God. We have to be careful about getting our crispest theology from narratives. 
we evaluate narratives in light of clear theological statements. In Exodus 34, I'll just read this one for you. In Exodus 34, Moses is cutting two more tablets of stone and going back up Mount Sinai to meet with God again. Remember, after the first ones got smashed because of what Israel was doing? Well, in Exodus 34, 5 through 7, and I think this is a, a wonderful balancing statement of the character of God. Listen. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Now, I don't think God is teaching us there that, that children and grandchildren will be individually responsible for what their grandparents did, but the grandparents and parents' sins will have an influence on the offspring, and a lot of times the offspring end up struggling with the same sins as the parents and the grandparents. But notice the balancing statement here. God reveals himself to us as merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But at the same time, not clearing the guilty or letting sinners simply walk away without consequence. You see, God is perfect in all of His being and character. He is merciful and gracious. He does forgive iniquity when we come to Him in repentance. But He is also holy and just, perfectly executing justice on those who remain in sinful rebellion like idolatry. And God is the perfect expression of all of those traits. They're not pitted against one another, those traits, but they are all perfectly a part of God's character. So it's true when we read Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9, that the Lord is gracious and full of compassion slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. That is true of our great God. But even the phrase, slow to anger and great in mercy, indicates there's a problem. And that problem needs to be addressed, and it's either going to be addressed through faith in the Messiah, even if it was faith in the coming Messiah, or it's going to be addressed in the judgment of God. One of two places. All right, now here's one of the first long quotes I promised you this morning, all right? I found a lot of help in the preacher's homiletical commentary, so, but I think, I think this will be easy to listen to, but sit back and relax a moment because I think this is helpful. If a human monarch or a human government had given such a command as we find given here to Saul, we should be bound to look at the command through what we know of his character and disposition. In other words, if you're going to go to, if somebody's going to command war, you look at the person who's commanding war and you think about their character and their motives. And if we knew him to be a man of integrity and benevolence, to conclude he had good ground for taking such a step. We cannot do less when we read such a sentence as that here issued against Amalek. We know that God loves the creatures whom he has made, that he is a God of peace, and that he desires peace on earth. If the men of the ancient world could rest assured that the judge of all the earth would and could, could do nothing but right, Genesis 18.25, he who possesses the New Testament record ought not to have the shadow of a doubt that all his dealings with men have at all times been actuated by the purest love and the highest wisdom. And that however stern and terrible some of them seem to us, 
they are in reality dispensations of mercy. In looking at the acts of the most perfect of humankind, we could not be certain of the perfect purity and wisdom of them all. But the same inspired book which records these acts of retributive justice reveals to us so much of the divine character as to make it certain that the final verdict of all His creatures will be just and true are Thy ways, Thou King of saints. Revelation 15.3 So we need to evaluate this command based on what we know of God. And we know God to be merciful and gracious as well as holy and just. And He will make the perfect decision in line with His holy character. Principle number three. This act of divine justice against Amalek was a part of God's covenant mercies to His people Israel. Now you know that God had promised to make a great nation of Abraham and through Abraham to bless all the nations of the earth. But in order for this to happen, God would preserve His national people Israel at least to the point that Messiah could come into the world and accomplish redemption. The presence of the Amalekites was a threat to Israel both physically and spiritually. And God's desire was to remove that threat. Listen to this from Dale Ralph Davis. It is precisely in God's vengeance that His people find comfort. Did you hear that? It is precisely in God's vengeance that His people find comfort. Yahweh does not forget how His enemies have hated, trampled, and crushed His people. To hear, see, your God will come with vengeance, Isaiah 35, 4, is to hear good news of great joy. For that means that God will put down and overthrow all who strangle and oppress His people. If He does not do that, what ultimate hope do we have? No vengeance on God's enemies means no deliverance for His people. The full gospel, the good news in all its completeness, always proclaims both the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Isaiah 61.2 His people enjoy His favor. His enemies receive His vengeance. Perhaps we do not understand this as we should, But God's suffering people always have. It is the bedrock of their prayers. In other words, a part of our redemption is God's just judgment on His and our enemies. Think about it. Throughout history, not only did God have to put down Israel's enemies so that Messiah could come, but He continued to put down the enemies who would have actually... um, stopped what God was doing if they understood. Now, the ironic thing is that God actually used the hatred of the Jews to accomplish redemption in crucifying Christ on the cross. But God always has to defeat the enemy, which ultimately includes Satan and fallen angels as well, in the process of accomplishing redemption and saving His people. You know, that quote by Davis ended with him saying, God's suffering people have always understood this. It's the bedrock of their prayers. And he cites Revelation 6, 9, and 10. It's the fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? The act of divine justice against the Amalekites was a part of God's covenant mercies to His people Israel. And you could say to His people Israel today. The fourth principle. This utter destruction of divine judgment what is sometimes called holy war, was initiated at God's command because of how enemies treated God's people. 
So it's just an extension of the last principle, isn't it? We know God is full of compassion by nature. He's also a God of perfect holiness. So he commanded Israel to drive out the Canaanites from the promised land. And this war with Amalek really is an extension of that command and in that same vein. Well, God didn't command the destruction of the Canaanites and the Amalekites because he's restless and vindictive. He commanded their destruction because of their sin and their sinful influence on his people. You could put it like this. No one receives unjust judgment from God. That was a short one. Principle number five. And uh, there are six of these. Well, seven. Number five, Israel's obedience in destroying Amalek was actually an act of devotion to God. Israel's obedience in destroying Amalek was actually an act of devotion to God. So this is something you don't necessarily get just from reading 1 Samuel 15 in the English without going a little bit deeper, but the language is included right there in the text. When God says to utterly destroy in the New King James Version, there in verse 3, go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. This is actually related to the concept of devoting something to God or placing something under the ban, as it sometimes literally is what it says. And it's described in the law in Leviticus 27 at the end of that book. Just a couple verses here. I'll read this one for you too. Nevertheless, no devoted offering that a man may devote to the Lord of all that he has both man and beast, or the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering is most holy to the Lord. Now listen to verse 29. No person under the ban who may become doomed to destruction among men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. All right, now I have... I have one, one of these longer quotes here, but I think it's just helpful to read this and for me to try to explain it myself. Again, this is from Preacher's Homiletical Commentary. I found this helpful. So he, they're talking about 1 Samuel 15, 3, and that phrase, utterly destroy. Utterly destroy Amalek, or literally put everything under the ban. Okay, So it's related to this law in Leviticus 27, Verses 28 and 29 about the devoted thing or the person placed under the ban. Listen to this explanation. The ban, of which we have here a notable instance, was an old custom existing probably before Moses, but formulated, regulated, and extended by him. In its simplest form, it was the devotion to God of any object, living or dead, when an Israelite or the whole congregation wished to devote to God anything, man, beast, or field, whether for the honor of God or to get rid of an injurious or accursed thing, it was brought and offered to the priest and could not then be redeemed. And if living, it must be put to death. Now listen to the explanation. A deep consciousness of man's sin and God's holiness underlay this law. The wicked thing, contrary to the spiritual theocratic life of God's people, must be removed, must be committed to him who was ruler and judge of God's people. And so the custom had a breadth of use as well as of meaning which it never had in other ancient nations. And then listen to this last part of this. I skipped a little bit here, but this is crucial. It says, to spare the devoted thing was a grave offense, calling down the vengeance of God. In later times, the ban was doubtless under prophetic direction softened, and in the New Testament times, the infliction of death had quite ceased. 
So what Israel was doing here was actually a part of God's law to Israel. And, and very briefly, I can't say it better than Richard Phillips in the Reformed Expository Commentary. He says this, the purpose of Saul's offensive, in other words, their attack on Amalek, the purpose of Saul's offensive was divine judgment. Now listen, the entire Amalekite nation was to be offered to the Lord in a display of perfect divine justice. So this concept of the devoted offering or a person under the ban helps us understand Saul's disobedience. You see, and this helps us understand what we're going to talk about more, our Lord willing, next week. For Saul to allow King Agag to live was a grave offense calling down the vengeance of God. It was not Saul's decision to make. And sparing Agag was an act of rebellious disobedience against God's clear command for one who had been placed under the ban according to the law of God. And we'll look at that more, Lord willing, next time. Principle number six. God often deals with nations as a whole and addresses their national sins with national judgment. Now the pattern we see is that if a people repents, God shows mercy. Do you remember when Jonah, for instance, was sent to Nineveh to preach God's judgment only to have them repent and be spared? But if a nation is warned or continues to sin, God will judge when he decides the time is right. And it's often not immediate judgment. And I think a lot of times the wait is to give people an opportunity to repent. But there's clearly no repentance as a whole amongst the Amalekites. So the judgment is often not immediate, and that's the case here, as it was hundreds of years after the original attack on Israel coming up out of Egypt, from then until now when Samuel is, or Saul is commanded to attack the Amalekites. But the Amalekites were still sinning in the same violent, evil fashion, attacking the weak and murdering for their own gain. One last quote. This one's shorter than the other ones. Preacher's homiletical commentary. Many ages had passed away since Amalek laid wait for Israel in the way when he came up out of Egypt. And the men who were guilty of the deed had long since left the earth. Yet the mention of it here shows that the sentence here passed upon the nation had special reference to that national sin which had been committed so long ago. At the same time, we must remember that the Amalekites of the time of Saul were possessed by the same spirit of hatred to Israel as their forefathers were. Although no reference is here made to their later attacks upon the Hebrew people in 1 Samuel 15, we know from other passages that the Amalekites now were no less cruel and murderous in disposition than their forefathers in the days of Moses. So there are times that God chooses to deal with nations as a whole and addresses their national sins with national judgment. And it is sobering when we think about our own country who in so many ways has walked away from any semblance of believing what God has revealed uh, of himself to us in the word. And even though there are people like us who love the Lord and who are a part of this nation, God may choose to bring temporal judgment to a nation like ours even before he comes back because of the prevalence of sin that's in our nation. It's happened in the past, hasn't it? When God was going to destroy, was it Sodom and Gomorrah? And they had that back and forth about how many righteous are in the city and Will it be destroyed? And God's people may even be involved at times, but when a nation turns whole scale 
away from the Lord, there are often re repercussions, and it's something for us to pray about, that God will show mercy instead of judgment. Well, the last one, number seven, is brief. But that is simply to say, and I want to make sure we understand this, that our holy war today is spiritual warfare. Because this was a specific command from God, and remember, it wasn't just 1 Samuel 15. It started in Exodus, was reiterated in Deuteronomy. It was something God clearly said, I am doing this thing. And so there's no precedent here for us to wage war. This does not give legitimacy to the Crusades to wipe people off the earth in the name of, of, of God. This was a specific situation from the command of God Himself. So there's no nation or religion today, at least I believe, that can claim holy war as justification for attack. I'm not saying it hasn't been attempted. I'm saying I don't think there's precedent for that in the same way as it is here. Now I'm not saying that you may not have to choose war at some point. What I'm saying is we shouldn't be calling it a holy war in this, in this sense that we see illustrated for us here in 1 Samuel 15, where God had commanded Israel to completely wipe out a nation. That is, has no place um, in our thinking, even though there, you, some people would make a case for just war, which is different. There's no case for us saying that, you know, I'm on a mission from God to wipe out a people group because they disagree with me. The purpose of this holy war in 1 Samuel 15 is the preservation of Israel and the execution of God's perfect judgment and justice on Amalek. And it was commanded by God for national Israel at a specific point in history, not a principle by which we live today. Now, I don't have time to go a lot further into that, but we know Jesus himself said, my kingdom is not of this world. When people wanted to pull out swords, Jesus said, put them away. That's not the battle that we're fighting. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in dark places. We are fighting a spiritual war, but we should not be using this particular instance to justify our own personal vengeance or wickedness. All right, that was a lot. But I want us to, uh, I want us to end by, again, thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I've mentioned a couple of times that God, in a sense, was defeating the enemies of Israel in order to preserve Israel and bring the Messiah and so part of God's divine justice against the Canaanites and the Amalekites was for the preservation of Israel, for the Messiah to come so that Abraham could be a blessing to all of the nations. And so while this is heavy, and it, like I said, it probably didn't answer all your questions, perhaps we can at least see that there's more here than maybe we initially think and be careful not to bring our own judgment against God in issues that we don't fully understand. But again, I would say, and especially if some of you perhaps have a troubled heart this morning, if it's because you're still in your sin and these topics of justice weigh heavily on you, there's a sense in which that's a mercy if the preaching of judgment causes us to shake if we are still living in rebellion against God. May it cause you to flee to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and in faith, turning from your wicked rebellion and trusting Jesus and His righteousness to save you and to make you right with this holy God who will bring about perfect justice in every situation. The beauty of the crucifixion of Christ is that perfect justice is accomplished with Christ on the cross. And as Paul said in Romans, it's what enabled God to remain both just and the justifier. In other words, he remains completely holy, and yet he has developed a way to address sin so that he remains holy, and we can be holy too, but our sin is judged. It's because it's judged in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you feel the heaviness of the wrath of God upon you, even being stored up in a treasury 
as it were, as the wrath of God against you, sin upon sin, rebellion upon rebellion, disobedience upon disobedience. And there's this treasury now of sin where God's wrath is set against it in judgment. That's only if you're outside of Christ. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Find refuge under His wings. Flee from the wrath to come by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes a preacher has to preach things that are, that are true, not because they're easy, but because they're true <laughs> and because they're in the Word of God. May this be profitable for our souls. God does not take sin lightly. And brother or sister in Christ, we need to grab a hold of that too. Even as His people, the fact that there's grace what Paul says it, right? Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. If there's anything we learn in this chapter, it's that God does not take sin and rebellion lightly. So if you don't know Christ, flee to Him. If we know Christ, yes, we can bask in the glory that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But that does not give us the excuse to treat our own remaining sin lightly as if it didn't matter well may the lord give us his view his holy view toward what that rebellion looks like to him and help us to fight it the rest of our days in the power that the lord jesus christ accomplished for us when he died on the cross and rose from the dead and that resurrection power is available for us in our fight against sin but you know, one of the things in the means of grace that God has provided in, the, in this fight against sin is the preaching of the word. And so maybe some of us this morning need to come to the Lord, even as believers, and say, Lord, I've been careless about my sin. Help me to see it as you see it. And even though it's covered in the blood of Christ, may I not bring disgrace to your name by wallowing and taking advantage of the fact that I have been forgiven. But to love you and your name enough to not want to bring disgrace to it by continuing on in unconfessed and unrepented of sin. But as we said at the outset, God is full of compassion and loving kindness, long-suffering, one who forgives. We can come to Him the first time or we can come back to Him for the thousandth time. And if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father God, these are heavy and difficult things. But we pray, Lord, that the preaching of the Word would be attended by Your Spirit for the profit of our souls. And whether those under my voice are believers or not, Lord, we pray that we would respond in the ways that would bring glory to your name, that the lost would turn from their sin and believe on Christ, and that the redeemed would show praise and appreciation for our salvation and a renewed commitment to pursue holiness along with the others who do the same thing. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.